Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation, and today I've got my friend from America back, Peter Jones. How are you, mate? Hello, Mr. Kerr. How are you, sir? Good, good. It's a stinking hot day in Sydney today. We're having a very late summer going into fall. How's things in your necks of the woods? Uh, there's still snow everywhere from November, ice about yay thick underneath it, and today it's back to high winds. So, Oh, well, there you go. We're still Ma in it. Maybe we can swap. <laughs> um, today we are going to do a show on a band that was very big in the UK, um, had a couple of hits in the US and quite huge in Australia as well. So if I mention these songs, Rebel Rouser, Peppermint Twist, Sweet F.A., Set Me Free, would a, a particular band call The Sweet or maybe Sweet come to mind? So right. we are going to cover the Sweet Fanny Adams album of 1974. So we're going to do a dig dive into all of the tracks, what we like, what we don't like. And as always, at the end of the show, we'll just give our summary of, um, yeah, what we think of the album and how it holds up to today. Right. So I'll just do some very quick stats and I'll throw it over to you, Pete. Um, in the UK, it hit number 27. So it was one of the few non-compilation albums. Uh, the Sweets were known as a singles band. So this is one of the very few non-compilation albums that actually cracked the charts. Um, in Australia, it hit number 33 and it didn't chart in America. And some of those uh, tracks on this album actually made it into Destination Boulevard, which we'll, I'm sure as the show goes on, we'll talk about. So, Thanks. mate, I'll throw it over to you. How about we talk about your first recollections of the suite in the day? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting thing here. And, and it's a tale of, of two continents again here, because I don't even I don't even think this Fanny Adams was actually even released here at all. Um, and those tracks didn't come out. And even our version of Boulevard was delayed beyond what it was released everywhere else. So the only thing I had heard was Little Willie and the Ballroom Blitz. Those were really the only two songs I was aware of um, until we heard uh, Desolation Boulevard in 75. And then we started to get some sense of who they were, but we really didn't dive into them deeply. And we kind of just listened to the singles, of course, there were other Love is Like Oxygen and Action and other songs that came out after that we were well aware of, but it just didn't somehow seem to permeate into our, our permanent listening routines. And it wasn't a band we dug deep or ventured out into. Uh, and that was a, a oversight as I'm discovering. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, thanks, Pete. Well, in Australia, um, as a young kid growing up in the 70s, I sort of have a vague memory of some of these hits being played on the radio and on the, the various video shows. But I think the song that I sort of mostly remember is Love Is Like Oxygen, which was a huge hit in the late 70s. And that was like, if you look at their career trajectory, that was a little bit of a, uh, a comeback for them um, because they had a, yeah. a bit of a lull before. Personally, I saw them in 1986 where Andy Ooh. Scott brought out uh, Sweet for a club tour of um, Australia. And boy, oh boy, were they, they heavy. So I think you had a lot of the old um, fans from the day coming to the show and they were absolutely blown away because it was a masterclass in hard rock. Right. And, uh, yeah, that, I was just so surprised because I thought they were going to be a little bit lighter, a bit more bubblegum, a bit more pop. But, boy, were they crunchy and were they heavy. It was like um, seeing maybe Deep Purple. Talk about that more later. Right, sure. Um, also saw them in the 90s. Um, again, Andy Scott's uh, version of The Sweet. Um, actually bumped into Mick Box at, uh, in the, the gents' room. So uh, <laughs> had a little bit of... Uh, there you go. Mick Box was living in Australia. So, uh, yeah, he was uh, obviously uh, friends with the band. So that's a little Great. bit of trivia. And the last time I saw them was, uh, again, Andy Scott Sweet supporting Richie Blackmore's Rainbow in the final run of um, 
tours that he did at the O2. I think it was a okay. special presentation show where he um, got all these new players. So I've seen them three times, but only wow, with cool. Andy Scott. I haven't seen them in the day, obviously. And, uh, you know, with three of the band members, uh, well, we're talking about Brian Connolly, the vocalist, now passed away. Steve Priest bass passed away. And Mick Tucker on drums passed away. Andy Scott is really the um, the last man standing of that classic era. So right. there you go. That's my um, my history of the band. Seen them, and um, they were you know fantastic, top notch live. So what we'll do is we'll wade straight into it. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive. So um, now, mate. I'm going according to the UK track listing. So if it's a little bit Ooh. skewy with what you've done, um, apologies. I'm sure we'll navigate our way through it. Okay. Um, I hope I've got all the same tracks. Yeah. So it's okay. We'll, we'll get through it. Um, first one is Set Me Free. Yes. All right. Well, this was a great adventure for me to go in with a completely clean mindset and experience this for the whole, really for the first time in its entirety. And like I said, what a reward and a great journey this, this turned out to be. You know, this is a powerful opening statement. You know, this is huge and glorious with tremendous drum fills. Um, turns out that, that Mick was an enormous fan of my buddy Ian Pace, my, my favorite drummer from Deep Purple. And there's even a quote that the band said, well, kind of to his detriment, he worked way harder than he needed to because he wanted to play like Ian. And you're like, you didn't have to play that much, mate. And he's like, ah, he just loved it. But boy, does it translate great to record. Just amazing. Um, you instantly notice how heavy this is compared to the singles that I was familiar with. Just substantially heavier. Um, relentless driving guitars into the verses. And I'm just going to say right off the bat, if... Brian Conley's not one of the most overlooked or underappreciated singers. I'm not sure who else qualifies. Um, huge voice, amazing range, really strong. The choruses with the ahs is, is very queen-like. And of course, this is going to be a common theme here because they treaded in a lot of the same waters. And two Queen albums and this album all came out within barely a year or so of each other. So there were a lot of influences kicking around back and forth and we can decide who's the chicken and who's the egg, but it really doesn't matter because we win either way. Um, monster solo section, just tremendous guitar playing. The bass work on it is exceptional. And, and to me, this is a whole step into what, you know, you've got proto metal influences. You've got all kinds of stuff here that, Plus, like you said, we've got elements of purple and other bands. It's got even the glam element in it. Um, I love the ending. It's got a kind of subtle little nod to the live ending of Smoke on the Water, which I thought was fun. The vocals are, and the lyrics are aggressive. And I think it's a stunning opener. And it, it was a, a really nice surprise to, to hear how heavy this was and also i mean i'm just going to say right off the bat this is one of the greatest sounding records i love how this record sounds you hear everything and there's a ton of low end but it's super clean and that's going to benefit the rest of the tracks as we go through oh mate i agree with you 100 percent. i think the um, production of phil wayman um who did work with xdc mud and bay city rolls is, is absolutely superb and the separation of instruments, the little effects. There's not mm -hmm. lots of little interesting effects. It's above the average uh, bubblegum record. Um, oh, yeah. And I'm not saying that this is a bubblegum record, but there's, you know, these really unfair tags that are um, attributed to this band and they are so much more. So just a little bit of context before I tell you what I think of this, this song. Um, they were really big based on their pop singles. So, um, and a lot of those pop singles were written by Mickey Chin and Mike Chapman. And Mike yeah, Chapman, right. we know, you know, produced Blondie, The Knack, um, producer extraordinaire. So I'm talking about songs like Blockbuster and Wigwam Bam. Now, on the flip side of those singles, they always did their own songs and they were always heavy. And 
I think they always had a hard rock heart. And that's what comes out in this album. This is the first album that they're actually allowed to shine and make a statement and be a little bit more crunchy, riffy, and less poppy. There's pop elements in it, don't get me wrong, but it's a lot of melody. I mean, it, yeah, if you like Uriah Heap, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, you will like this album. It's right in that wheelhouse. So Set Me Free, I think it's a ball terror of an opener. It's a great opening track. And, oh, my God, Andy Scott, he just uses every trick in the book in his guitar work. You know, he's got the whammy bar out. He's got the feedback. And, mate, I'm sorry. They've been listening to this. Yeah, they have. <laughs> without, without a doubt. It's got the galloping. So, you know, this album you know, sort of invented the ga galloping um, proto-metal right. of UFO and um, Iron Maiden. Maiden. Another, sh another right. show discussion there, but this is where the, you know, invented it. So, I mean, you look at, uh, listen to Set Me Free, it's got that heart, you know, that galloping of, um, you know, sort of hard-loving man, you know, mm -hmm. very, very similar. I well, love the soul. I, yeah. And I love that during that whole solo section, they just slowly introduce the phase shifter, which takes over the whole track. It's not just the guitar, which is the very queen element um, again. And, but it, it gives it that great. And then all of a sudden it cuts back right into the opening riff and back into the last verse. And it just is amazing. Yes. It's absolutely superb. You've, you've summed it up and um, you know, everyone is just virtuosos. And when I was listening to this album, I go, Oh dear, Pete's going to love this because the drumming, it's just it's spick, these little yeah. fills all the way through. So Great chops. Absolutely. So with Step Me Free, you take away the harmonies, you put in um, a Hammond, it's deep purple to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I yeah, I love it. I think it's a great opening track. Okay. All right. Next one is Heartbreak Today. All right. Starts with a really nice... Chunky, chunk, cha chunk, cha chunk, with a nice little flange across. And then all of a sudden it goes into what I call the Led Zeppelin like riff. And the one that came to mind was how many more times? Dun, da, 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 da. But it instantly goes into its off into its own way. And the verse is just kind of driving at that great tempo. You get to the chorus, it's got a halftime, you know, it's that, oh no, and it's just the huge, thick vocals. All four of these guys could sing. And, you know, again, broken record, it's got a lot of the elements that Roger Taylor for Queen would bring on Queen 2 and Sheer Heart Attack. These slides up to the up to the octaves and it's so glorious and so big. It's the chorus is huge. Again, really great, great bass playing. And again, this is that era that I think bass players just thrived. It just, they all sounded great. They're so present in the mix. Um, you get to, and I, I think it's, I put this down, it's it's very British sounding. It's, this is not an American sound. This is that aisle. It's got that purple, that, that of that flavor. Um, I think it's an amazing solo section with, you know, great Brian May, like harmonies going back and forth. Again, we can talk about who got it from what. Um, it's just a straightforward rocker. Lots of energy. I love the completely out of nowhere funky part at the end of it. I'm like, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> um, and it just ends with a lot of energy and a lot of power. And, and so far, they're two for two. Yeah, two for two here, too, as well. Um I wrote down early Judas Priest rock and roller. This song, I, I reckon yeah. this this could uh, slot onto that album. That that's sonically that sound. I love the multi track vocals. I love the falsetto harmonies. That's their um, you know that's their sound. It's wonderful. Uh, one person on social media said it, it sounded very similar to Deep Purple Bloodsucker. I'm not quite sure about that, but anyway. Close enough. You know, it, it's it's not too far off base. I mean, you can see the elements are there. Right, Pete. So we'll go to the third track. Um, no, you don't. And this was written by Nikki Chin and Mike Chapman. What do you think of this song? This is a great song. And I was very, very familiar with this as a lot of 
people will be, especially here in the U.S. Uh, it was on Pep Benatar's first record, which, of course, was produced by Mike Chapman. Um, it, and they do a very uh, faithful um, cover of it. And, and it's very authentic and heavy. And a lot of the drumming is very similar from uh, from that album. Um, it's a great, great heavy track. Lots of great drumming. Um, and we've got Steve Priest on here and there's no drop off in vocals here. It sounds great. I mean, he could be a lead singer in any band <laughs> and it would be, it would be more than okay. Um, I love the little interlude section, which is very who like, um, but most of it is just a straightforward rock and roll song. That's aggressive, heavy and punchy. And it's, it's so hooky. Uh, and catchy, and that combination of heaviness with that is a winner for me. It's a great track. Yeah, I agree with you completely, and I am familiar with the Pat Benatar version, but um, this version's uh, just as good. It's it's mm-hmm. hard hitting, it's assertive. Um, yeah, I love it a lot. I love that sort of um, that acoustic um, middle section with the soaring violins. I love that a lot. I think that's a nice little touch. Um, the interesting thing about why Steve Priest actually um, sung this uh, um, on this track is that uh, Brian Connolly got into a, a fight and he had a, um, a throat injury and right. he lost a lot of his vocal range. So during the recording of this album, there are a couple of tracks that were taken up by Steve Priest, um, et cetera, and this was one of them. And that's the reason why Brian Connolly was not on, um, did not sing on this um, on this particular track. Mm. But um, yeah, I think it's a it's a great one, and um, well done to Pat Benatar to picking this this up. Um, there's been lots of artists. Uh, I know uh, Joan Jett has covered, uh, Vince yep. Neil, Motley Crue yep. have um, covered them. I think even Cheap Trick and the Ramones. So, yeah, you know, wide, we'll talk- wide, wide we'll- sphere of influences here. Absolutely. We'll talk more about that in the back end of the show. But, uh, yeah, definitely a great uh, song for Pat Bennett to pick up. And, um, yeah. yeah, this she is a great it. track. Yeah. All right. Next one is All Rebel Rouser. So yes. Judy. And this to me has got what I consider kind of one of the trademarks of sweet. The the riding of the snare drum. They do it in a lot of tracks and it's kind of their 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 thing. And I said here this is extremely glammy. It's also very can be very early punk. Because that type of snare drum thing carried over into punk. You just mentioned Joan Jett. I think every one of her big hits starts out with a snare drum. Something just like that. Um, Huge chorus. And I love the syncopation that's going on all over the place. But especially in the chorus. And the bridge is, is even heavier. And once they get to He's a Rebel. And they go, He's a Rebel. It all of a sudden gets really metal sounding. It's dark and it's got really aggressive and kind of doomy chord progression on it. And then, boom, they go right back into where they were. And I mentioned, I said, it's kind of interesting that it seems from what I had read that a lot of what they were trying to do was to kind of get out of that Chapman chin thumb of always being pressed into stuff. But the structure of this song is very similar (laughs) to many of the Chapman chin songs, especially one that's later on this record. Um, So the the influence of them didn't stray too far because even though this is their composition, it's got those elements in it and it sounds like sweet. Um, You know, it's uh, what a catchy chorus, you know, rebel rouser, rebel rouser. I mean, it's, it's just all go. And I, I love that. And so far, this album has just not relented at all. It's just go, go, go. Why wasn't and, this a hit in the US? I'm, uh, I'm look, sorry, we're halfway through, but it's a real head scratch, isn't it? Yeah, it just, you know, and, you know, some bands and there's, you know, it's a, a conversation for a different show. You know, a lot of bad luck, a lot of self-destruction, um, mm. a lot of things that were preventable and some that just seem to be fate um, that 
kept them from, I mean, this is just one of those bands that just should have been absolutely massive. Yeah. Everywhere. Yep. And the music yep. justifies it without any compromise, in, in my opinion. Well, when you look at the 70s British glam, there was not that many that translated in any shape or form. So um, you had Slade could barely get arrested in the States. The covers um, sold way more than the originals. Yeah, Mud, um, even like T-Rex, you know, which we did on another show, there was only one song um, that uh, did any business in the States. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of those glam bands in the 70s just did not trans translate. Um, yeah. It was just a bit of a phenomenon in, in, in the UK and uh, Europe. But Do you uh, think it's hard once, once a band fairly or unfairly kind of gets pigeonholed into a style um, and you want to take a right turn, sometimes it's not too easy to turn <laughs> the ship that's been drudging mm. forward and the path that you've already kind of laid for yourself. And like you said, all of those early singles are so different. than these. They're just yeah. almost like a different band, although they, there's elements that tie them together. Yeah. But I've got to think that it's got to be hard to get somebody to take it seriously after the fact that, hey, hold on, we're, we're really something else here. Maybe it's the glam. Maybe it's the the satin clothing and the image, um, the, and the makeup. headdresses, and maybe yeah. that was the thing that yeah. turned it off. Because as I said, if they wore more street clothing, denim, stripped it down, right. they'd be up there with purple and Uriah Heap. Um, right. Seventy four, seventy three was still mm. uh, a high water mark of hard rock and heavy metal, or early heavy metal. So I right. can't see why they wouldn't have uh, done well with this album. Rebel Rouser, I love it. To me, it's always, a, 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 in glam, there's always a bit of a throwback to the old golden age of rock and roll. Your Chuck Berry, your Elvis yes. Presley, your Jerry Lee Lewis, um, you know, the bodgies, um, the gangs. And, and I, th I think it really plays up in, you know, that imagery of the 50s. And a lot of those glam acts really go back to a bit of a throwback to the 50s with their themes, you know, the the rebellious um, guy from, you know, and or the, the girl that can't be attained. I love Rebel Rouser. Um, it's an atypical sweet song. So if you wanted to pinpoint one song off this album that says this sums up the sweet, and actually they were called sweet. They were, weren't called the sweet for this album. Um, right. Rebel Rouser, that would be my pick as the song that this sums up their sound. Um, it's full of exaggerated drama. And I love the um, the spoken word, you know, where he, he does this little spoken word bit as part of the song. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So over the top, pushed as far as you go, I think it's a great song. Now, the next one um, is a cover, Mr. Jones, and this is Peppermint Twist. Again, goes into that 50s uh, throwback. What do you think of this song? Well, I love this. And, of course, in the U.S., this, the original, um, way back to 1962, Joey D and, and the Starlighters, um, it was a number one hit. This knocked Chubby Checker off as the twist song. This one came over. And, and, and this is you know, basically a very true representation, just kind of <laughs> turned up to 11. You know, it's a, it's a, you take very early punk elements, you wrap it in a traditional blues form, which is what all those early rock and roll songs were. And you add a ton of vocal parts to it. And a song that is just one big sing-along. The whole song is just a sing-along, you know? And it, it's just infectious. It's a great cover. And it would work perfectly in the timeline with anything that they were doing. It plays, just like it does on the record here, flawlessly right next to something like Rebel Rouser. It just fits. And even though it's from an earlier period, it is still so cohesive with the way they're doing it that it just really, really works, you know. And I don't even call it a novelty 
because I mean, I think this is a full fledged, you know, cover song that's easily as good. It's a different element. You, you know, it's not 1962, um, but it, it works perfectly. And I didn't listen to it going, oh, okay. Like maybe as an example, whether you like the song or not, like Big Ten Inch by Aerosmith, you're like, well, okay. Does but you had work? a smile on your face, didn't you? I bet you while listening to this song. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I, had, I was just like, okay. And he's just like, how can, how can you get away with the pop shoe? Ah, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> how can you get away from that? It's, yeah. just, it's, you know, it's just great stuff. And that's just pure, straight, traditional rock and roll. And that will always work in my camp. Again, it falls into the template of glam being very nostalgic and going back to the 50s. So I wrote down feel good nostalgia. I think you <laughs> summed it up perfectly. And I yeah, think it's a nice, it. nice little, um, you know, in the track listing, it, it's a nice little palate cleanser. Um, Absolutely. All righty. Now we get back into a little bit heavy uh, territory with Sweet F.A. Um, I, won't, I don't swear on this show, but uh, it, uh, F.A. means something. <laughs> far out. <laughs> no, not far out or whatever it is. Um <laughs> This is a uh, this could, sweet uh, sweet f all or something yeah, sweet, something along those lines. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll leave it. We'll yeah. Leave it going. Um, this goes for six minutes and fifteen seconds, but boy, it's not boring any shape and form. You're not looking at your watch for it to to finish. This is a, a masterclass. What do you think of this song? It's like you said, it's the longest track. Again, a wonderful snare drum, heavy intro with clearly the heaviest riff on the records. Um, it's extremely distorted. You know, it's just full of moxie, um, all attitude. Um, but then it doesn't carry that all the way through. It instantly changes to a more pop feel, but then it goes right back to the same doomy riff. And it, it is such a nice juxtaposition of each other. And and I had to mention the bass playing on this because not all the tracks were similarly uh, balanced. Steve's bass on this is way up front, and man, is it fun to listen to. He's it reminds me of the you know the Dunaway stuff with Alice Cooper um, that is just so melodic all on its own. You can just listen to just the bass, and I'm really excited about hearing that. Huge, huge, strong vocals from Conley on here. Um, the choruses are are massive and driving. Um, this is just a clinic in in old school heavy drumming, um, you know. And then they add this little synth part uh, back to the opening riff, and a really the instrumental sections are so tight and they're so cohesive. And of course, anytime you can add a gong, but not just once, but twice, I'm all in. Um, huge backing vocals. You know, I put in this guitar solo, I said, how underrated is Andy Scott? Holy smokes. This is an This is an extended jam that is as heavy as anything Sabbath, Purple, or Zeppelin were doing, and perhaps even heavier. It's just incredible. Um, yeah. It's by far my favorite track on the record. Um, and I, it was a, kind of a strange, abrupt ending. But, I mean, it had to end somewhere. I mean, I just wish it had kept going. I'd have been happy if this would have turned into Space Truck and then they jammed for 25 minutes. You know, <laughs> I would have been perfectly happy. But just a monster of a track. And you get all your street cred with me if this was the only track I'd ever heard because this – this works on every level. Yeah, look, I agree. And um, as I said, uh, Andy Scott, it, it's just so underrated. Nobody talks about him in the same breath of those guitar heroes of the 70s. They need to. He needs to um, get more recognition and hopefully few viewers that watch this show um, spread the word. Um, well, because- like you said, he had everything. He mm. had all the tricks. He had the whammy bar. He had the finger stuff he had a- very influenced oh. by richie blackmore though you could tell he that he great, was like oh yeah. you know very a great uh, great tone and incidentally richie was a big fan of the suite he loves them 
Mm. And um, I think he's had a, a jam or two with them on stage. So he, Richie doesn't like many, but he liked the sweet. Oh, Very sweet. cool. Yeah, um, this song sounds like Hard Loving Man. It's got that galloping, dun, 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 you know, it's got that sort of same sort of feel about it. Um, and I love how you highlighted that end or that outro. It, I, I put down one word, bonkers. It just goes bonkers. It's just everything but the kitchen sink. I love it. And anything that starts off, you know, or has a, a lyric, well, it's Friday night and I need a fight. You know, yes, it, you know what's what the the you know the song's going to be about. So, no, I love it. I think this this is another classic, uh, sweet song, and um, yeah, I agree. I think it's one of the best tracks on the album. Well, and I think too, um, you know, we haven't touched on them, and that's okay. People should go back and when they listen, read the lyrics as they do them. You know, there's some really aggressive stuff in here. Um, you know, this one particularly, you know. If she don't spread, I'm going to bust her head. The guy has gone mad because his chick's been had. There's no bubble gum in, in those lyrics, folks. Mm -hmm. There's no it wig isn't. Wham, you know, no. Yeah. And that may be that may be to the detriment of the band because there's a, a certain amount of dual personality here and that may have confused. You know what I was saying when I saw them in the 80s and a lot of right. the, the fans from the 70s mm -hmm. and they were, you know, came out and played all this heavy stuff and a lot of the fans were like this and then they'd get excited when they play the hits so there was sort of like this dual personality of the um, band and that may have been to the detriment where people were trying my to under my understanding from all the things that i've read peter is that there was a certain degree of intentional debauchery that these guys carried with them you know a david lee roth way before david lee roth <laughs> You know, um, maybe not the most PC kind of behavior and certainly something we would look at today and kind of roll our eyes with. Brian but, Connolly was definitely a larger than life character. And, yeah. um, and they didn't apologize for it either. Yeah. Well, apparently there was a showcase gig in the late 70s in front of these record executives and he basically turned up drunk. And collapsed on stage, and the band yeah, had to continue <laughs> continue the performance for the, the rest of the show. So, um, if you're in front of suits, yeah, you don't do that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, sadly, that's a familiar tale with other bands who were on the cusps, and we won't ab name names. Today, but ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely, restless. I like this song. It slowed down a bit more of a, a bit of a groove. What do you think of this song? You know, another big opening. All of these songs have great introductions. Um, I mean, they kind of just hit you right in the face. Um, they're not really mincing any words. They're like, here we are. Hmm. Um, you know, Steve Priest on vocals here. And and I first thing I wrote down, I go, hmm, Ace Fraley influenced by Sweet. <laughs> join the join the queue, mate. There's a lot. Oh, there's, of, there's, there's a lot of bands. To <laughs> you know, um, but you could easily hear this could be a song that Ace could put in his repertoire and it would have worked perfectly with the way he phrases, the way he sings, mm. everything. Um, mm. It's one of the sl first slower grooves on here. Uh, up until this point, things have been pretty charged. Um, it's a great, great, slow, heavy drumming, great bass playing. Uh, I think the verses are kind of punky. Um the chorus is just very hook. Um, and even though they slow the tempo down, the energy levels don't drop at all. And that's a sign of a great band. You know, obviously that's what made Sabbath who they were is the fact that you could just slow it down, but not lose the energy and the power. And that's not something a lot of bands can do well. Um, you know, great riffs, great solo section on here. Um yeah, it's just another strong song, and and it's all about songs, um, with great delivery and great sonics and great vocal delivery. And I'm like, check the boxes; <laughs> they're all working. Yeah. Well, I've been ticking every box as you've been going along, so yeah, yeah, um, it's doing pretty well so far. I think this is a masterclass for Phil Wayman's um, production. production. It's wonderful. Yeah. 
It's fantastic. Nice little effects. Um, I wrote down the verses sound a little bit like Heartbreak Hotel. Have a listen. A little bit similar. Um, I love the falsetto vocal harmonies all the way through. And if that didn't cross-pollinate with Queen, I don't know. I mean, did they pick this up from Uriah Heep? Because Uriah Heep were one of the first ones... um, very heavy, very humble. That came out in 69. Now, I know the suite. If you look at the story, they go back to the 60s and there's a whole family tree of various bands and blah, blah, blah. Right. But I'm just wondering, um, maybe they heard Uriah Heep and that's, you know, tweaked as to... Well, I don't know how in their environment at the time you don't. Mm. You know, if you've got any appreciation you know as as musicians back then for any uh, purple or anybody like that heap would have to somehow be on your radar i i, I can't imagine that somehow they just overlooked them <laughs> absolutely um, and david byron's got very exaggerated i love david byron folks um and he had a very uh wide range vocals and he did this really exaggerated falsetto and i'm just wondering if they picked up on that falsetto and then put it through the the prism of the suite, did it in their own style. But it's, look, you've got a melting pot of all these bands around the same time. Queen must be listening to Sweet. Sweet listens to Queen, listens to Uriah Heat, listens to Deep Purple. What a fertile ground, a fertile creative ground. And that's why there was so much glorious hard rock, folks, because there was just so much great music in that particular period. So, well, I have I have two quick quotes here from Andy Scott that I think maybe fit right into what you're saying. He said, I was scared to death when I heard Queen's first record, because till then I thought we were doing all right. Right. Then he said, we heard Killer Queen. And I thought, yep, we're getting ripped off. Maybe two you're complete, two completely different views yep. of a band that released an album one month before them and then four to five months after them. Well, this that, adds, record- that adds weight to my um, theory about Uriah Heap. Yeah. And maybe a bit of Beach Boys. I mean, I'm thinking of the vocal harmonies and the 60s. Anything that had that vocal harmonies within a pop or rock environment would have been an influence. But I think with Uriah Heap, definitely on that first album, it showed that you could use that in a musical template in a with riffage well, and a deep and, bottom end. And we can't overlook the pop bands of the era because they would have influence as well. Mm. You know, even something uh, like the Monkees. Or any of those things that had these big, thick, rich vocals are make a song instantly accessible. We they just charged up underneath what was going on, but you still keep that common element, and that's always been the difference moving forward for me. When bands with the growling and things, they lose the melody and they lose mm. the vocal. As soon as they do that for me, I have a hard time moving forward. You keep yeah. the melody. You keep a strong singing core, you can kind of almost do anything you want underneath that's true to yourself, yeah. and it's going to have something that somebody can hold on to. And I well, think the, that's... I agree. And the musicology, folks, on this album is just out of sight. That was the thing that I found really that pop, popped out of the speakers or my headphones when I was listening to this album. The right. musicology, the, the virtuosity of all the players on this oh, album. Oh, they're tremendous players. Yep. All four of them are great, great musicians. No question. Right. Well, we're coming to the business end. Two more tracks to go, and we're just covering the tracks. And there's almost there's bonus tracks and singles, and maybe we'll do that on another show. Um, Into the Night. What do you think of this one? Another great track. Uh, this one time a vocal from Andy. Um, another great snare drum intro. Uh, I'm, I will never get tired of that. That's right in my wheelhouse. Heavy supporting riff, uh, and then into this full driving rhythm. Um, and it goes back and forth between halftime, full time. And then what I really like in here is this kind of the verses are kind of this call and response. They do the first part into the night, and then they do a riff, 
into the night. And it's kind of preachy in a, in a good way. You know, it's like, I state this and they all into the night, but it doesn't sound like that, you know, chanty chorus stuff that I, that, that I don't like. This just worked. Um, some really great tight guitar playing here. Um, and in this, I'm going to say in this case, it's, it's very Andy Scottish. If Brian may happen to sound like him, that's an accident. I'll, I'll just twist it for the rest for this one. Um, okay. Another great snare drum breakdown. Uh, and then these kind of weird kind of demonic with this sounds with this gong swell. And then the drums just carry the day. And, you know, it, it's, it's a song about, I don't know, things, things seem to be getting out of hand and they're kind of just slipping away. And um, it's a super tight ending really great layered guitars as it fades out. And it's, it's just a fun song and there's so many great elements of it. And in contrast to the quicker tunes, the last two that we've just done, I, I appreciated the slightly slower tempos um, to give it a real nice variety. Um, so it just it wasn't one dimensional. Um, it's pretty much covering all the bases. Um, and this was a nice addition to that, that it kind of checked that box. And so it works. Yeah, I agree with everything you've said. Um, just a couple of things I'll add. It sounds very similar to Super Trooper of um, Deep oh, Purple. Yeah. Great. Um, also, I love that gloomy part that you alluded to. It, it goes into semi-Black Sabbath territory. As I said, it's some some of these little effects that uh, the band brings out. It goes in a different direction, and I, I found that completely bonkers. Um, yeah, for a moment it gets really kind of dark and gloomy, and then it sort of reverts back. So, no, I think it's a it's a great song, and um, yeah, the double tracking of Brian May. Well, you know, um, I'm just going to go. If it's what, good, it's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what more can what more can you say? If it's good, it's good. The finale, the last song, ACDC. So can't make up her mind, some other woman as well as me. What do you think of this song, mate? Uh, this is the song I was most familiar with. I have played this uh, in a cover band for years. Um, so I had done Joan Jett's version. Um so uh, going back and listening, of course, I would always go to the original when I was learning a song as well, but I learned it from Jones um, and it enhanced and embellished because in the breaks here, they let the time go through with silence. But in Jones version, they bring the drums and the snare in just like a, a typical sweet song to connect the verses and the choruses together. And when I first heard it, I'm like, oh, there's no snare on this one. <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, that's right. They didn't, they didn't use it. I like how Joan added the snare because to me, it sounds like what Sweet would have done if they would have added the snare. It was, it, was, it was perfect. She's very true to this. The structure and the form of the song is as it is right here. Um, it's heavy um, and, and it works for her um, both lyrically um it it fits um and it's it's a great closing track um and i've have no issues with this at all and i think it, it fits perfectly with everything that's going on and it's one of one of the stronger chapman chin songs um and i just think it's a fun song and i always had a blast playing it so yeah thank you thank you that's um i think it's a great finish to the album yeah. Um, I love the little slide guitar bits, very subtle. If you have the headphones here, you hear this all the way through. It's um, kind of his first, it's his only slide solo. Mm, nice. It's all the way through. I think it's a fun track. It's playful. Um, it's a gender bender song, which was, you know, That's for 1974 was kind of out there. Way um, ahead of the curve. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, yeah. Fantastic finish to the album. So yeah, I agree. Mate, you look at this album and you look at The Sweet or Sweet, and they have influenced so many bands. And I wrote down Kiss, Motley Crue, Death Leopard, and that's only at the tip of the iceberg. There's so many right. hair metal or glam metal bands in America. 
that have tapped into the wheelhouse of the suite. And, you know, suite, as a, it's a bit of a head scratch. They weren't huge in America, a bar, a couple no. of songs here and there. And, um, like, we've covered these songs and there could have been a, a few more singles that should have been, could have been monster hits. When Motley Crue put their ad out to look for a singer, do you know what it said? I bet it referenced the suite. It said, wanted Brian Conley lookalike. Right. (laughs) That was their ad. (laughs) There you go, mate. There you go. Just to wrap things up, so what do you think of the album? Tremendous. Tremendous. I'm so glad that I was... uh, went back and discovered this at, you know, uh, when you challenged me to go listen to it. Um, I'm much richer for it. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful addition. Um, and it's something I'm definitely going to explore more. Um, I mean, the rest of their catalog is now in, in the prime target zone, um, as I go through these, cause I mean, every element in this is like you said, is something that's going to appeal to me. Mm. Um, if not just a few of them, maybe all of them, in some cases, they're, they're marking all the things that I would typically like, you know, being a huge purple fan and, and all the things that go along with it. You know, it's, you know, we talk about everything. It's the songs were great. The compositions, uh, the singing is great. The musicianship is outstanding. And I cannot understate that this just sounds spectacular. And it's so clean and so heavy. Um, And it's just like, this is just a a world-class band releasing an exceptionally strong record. Mm. And really, you can't put it any other way than that. Yeah, yeah. Look, I agree. I think this is a superb album. Folks, if you want to go into the Sweet Catalog, I think this is a great starting point. I mean, a lot of people go to the greatest hits, and that's fine. But if you want to hear an album from top to bottom, this is probably one of the strongest albums, top to bottom, of their discography. And, um, yeah, influenced so many bands, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not that they'll ever listen to, you know, what, what I say. Thank you, mate. As always, you. deliver the goods. Please Pleasure. like and please like and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Tell us your thoughts. Pete and I really enjoy reading the comments. Tell us what you think of the suite. Um, your favorite songs. Maybe um nominate the next album in the suite catalog that we should listen to, because I think we'll be doing another sweet song a sweet song or sweet show um, very, very soon. So um, thank you, Pete. And thank you. See you later. Bye.